You're watching Grassroots Community TV, the nation's original community-operated television station, protecting and nurturing open channels of communication for the citizens of the Roaring Fork Valley since 1972. We're moving from a big idea and each, each part of this event is trying to get us down to more details. So there are no speakers during lunch, so people can talk all they want. But if you want to get to lunch, we should take a seat. So Amy suggested and presented how there's a whole economic e ecosystem out there that is evolving. And there's new rules and new opportunities and very creative ideas. And Josh took that at the Main Street level and, and talked about some of the same things are happening in the physical environment in terms of how people are using spaces. And this real neat intersection between economy, place, the internet, and social interaction. Uh, I mean, I, we live in small communities, so it's, I think one of the reasons we like that is we like the interaction. Um, but w w I think w one of the things that social media has shown is that people want that everywhere. And in small towns, big towns, people want a, a way to connect, a way to feel like they're part of something larger than, than themselves. And all these neat ideas are starting to come together and have economic and planning and community consequences. So it's a very exciting time. And the, the idea of the rules changing is this ongoing theme because remember the slide at the beginning of the day, things really changed in 2008. I mean, dramatically. The whole world changed because of what happened with our economy and the way it dropped. And all this creativity started to happen because of that. So what we're going to talk about before lunch is just a few examples of some really neat ideas that are uh, not entirely local vesting, not entirely uh, community investment, but this whole notion of thinking about economic development in a different way, one that's a lot, lot more locally focused, about saving resources, generating uh, or freeing up capital for other uses, uh, and solving multiple problems at the same time. So we're going to start with uh, the whole notion of energy. And Erica Sparhawk is going to, from uh, CLEAR, is going to talk about their efforts in the region. Uh, we're going to quickly shift to uh, Doreen Harriet and Jill Zeman, who's going to, they're going to talk a really, a really interesting job training program. Uh, Josh mentioned one out in uh, California where they're training uh, folks for high-end design. Well, we actually have that in Garfield County. Maybe not high-end design, but they're going to explain what they're doing. Uh, and then uh, we're very fortunate to have Bill Stevenson from Rocky Mountain uh, um, Farmers Union uh, to talk about a new health insurance program that is a cooperative uh, that's going to be offered in 2014 in the state of Colorado. Uh, so with that as an introduction, I'll bring Erica up and we'll get started. Good morning. Um, my name is Erica Sparhawk. I work for CLEAR, which is Clean Energy Economy for the Region, and it's great to be here today. I was really inspiring listening to Amy and Josh's presentations. Um, 
particularly the part about how much retail space is out there in square footage of buildings. And I was thinking of Mike and Dan Richardson here of how much work we have to do for upgrading buildings. <laughs> um, but I'm going to talk today about our work. Um, our biggest program is Garfield Clean Energy, and that's a program right here in Garfield County. And Garfield Clean Energy is the first energy authority in Colorado. It is actually now its own government agency. Um, these are all the partners. It's made up of all the towns in Garfield County, the, the county itself, the library district, and RAFTA, which is our local transit authority. Um, in addition to that, we have partnerships with the chambers, with uh, our contractors, such as SGM. We have um, really good relationships with you know, other economic development groups just to keep this discussion going and keep moving our programs forward. Um, and what I want to talk about is part of our work, um, actually, and my coworker Mike Ogburn, which I forgot to introduce, is here, and he's from CLEAR, um, and he helped lead up some of these chart <laughs> that uh, I'm going to show so he can answer more in-depth questions. But one of the questions we had was how much energy are we using in Garfield County? And um, so we did an energy inventory. And the total energy use is $219 million, and that was in 2009. Um, and if we were to save, as you can see, one of our goals, if we were to save just 20% of that, that's $43 million that would stay in the county, that we're not spending on fuel, that we're not spending on electricity and sending to, I mean, these are big companies that are not located here locally. So what can we do to save that money and make it possible for people to spend it locally or just keep it locally in savings or make it it's more efficient for our towns to operate. So we charted out what would it look like if, if we're going to meet these goals of 20% by 2020, um, the energy that we're going to be spending by year 2020 is $329 million a year. And in the next 10 years from 2010 to 2020, that's three billion dollars in cumulative energy spending that our whole, that just one county is going to be spending. So if we can meet these goals that all of the partners of Garfield Clean Energy and Garfield Clean Energy has adopted, which is 20 percent reduction in energy use or 20 percent more efficient by 2020, then what do we get? Then we're looking at 297 million dollars in cumulative savings over the next 10 years. That is money that would not leave our pockets to go to spending on these fuel, fuels that we use to run our cars, heat our buildings, run our lights. And what we have been doing is we've been doing this work for the last three years. And we're really excited about the impact that we're having on businesses, on our local governments, um, and on our, in our households, the residents that we work with to save energy. In the last three years, we've generated $3.7 million in energy upgrade work, and that's working with over 140 contractors. And then that work, and that is actual upgrade buildings, I mean, that's going to generate $1.6 million in annual energy savings. And then here are some numbers of, I mean, this is 132 homes. We've worked in 41 public buildings in the county. Um, we've got, actually, it's 95 businesses here. We're now up to over 110 businesses. Um, we also work on transportation and vehicles, working on getting those converted to local fuels and um, adding stations, looking, working on electric vehicles and renewable energy projects. And this has all been key to this energy authority that we have. It's the towns that are partners that are leading this work. It's the county. It's, it's them taking on projects themselves. This is a, um, a solar array system installed on the writing arena in, Gar in Rifle. We also work with the, um, biz with the public buildings. We have all their energy use up on a website called Garfield Energy Navigator. And um, we developed this tool so we could track their energy use, but also track their solar use um, and offsets. But more importantly, provide a really important tool for facility managers to use, for the public to understand. This is available. You can go to uh, garfieldenergynavigator.org and check out the buildings in your town in Garfield County or any town in Garfield County 
and the county itself um, and look at their energy use. And not only that, but we wanted to raise just the awareness of energy savings and the potential there is as economic development across the community. So if we as citizens see that our governments are saving money, then we might think, oh, my, my business might be able to save some money. I should, I should get in touch with these guys, or I could probably save some money on my house utility bill. Um, so we're really excited about this tool, and um, Mike was actually just in Summit County yesterday meeting with the school district there, because they want to, they're, they're up and running on this and want to start moving in that direction, because there are real energy savings opportunities here. We have a couple projects where um, I mean, we've seen public buildings save 20 to 30% in their energy use just by monitoring their energy and seeing when something kicks on and is not supposed to and it really can help optimize the energy use in that building which ultimately is saving tax dollars and it makes those towns who might be operating on tight budgets maybe able to put some money into a different pool because look their utility bills went down so it could be an effective maybe they could put that money into historic downtown development or you know bringing these tools together providing more local investing opportunities and then we've had great participation across the community. Um, we have, like I said, businesses. I'll highlight some in just a minute. We've got some great pictures. <laughs> um, and great savings that some local businesses are seeing, which makes them stronger. And as Amy was talking in her presentation, if we invest in our existing businesses that are already here, and we're not trying to entice the big box store in, then we're building a stronger economy, whether it's in downtown. I mean, our communities are small enough that it's, it's helping our local economy. Um, this is a picture of Ruben, who's a student who was part of one of our energy clubs at Carbondale Middle School. And he took it to heart, went home. His mom, according to the report she gave the teacher at the parent-teacher conference, said she thought he was crazy. <laughs> he was closing all the curtains when he left for school in the morning. He was telling her to wash all the laundry in cold. He you know, went to the store with her, showed her all the CFL bulbs, replaced everything. And they reduced their bills from $190 a month to $90 a month. Um, so then he made a deal with her, because he's a smart kid, <laughs> 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 that if he continues saving money, then he gets that money. And so this was like at the beginning of the summer. So the bill went from, I think the summer bill was $80, and it went down to $56. Um, so he took it to a whole new level. I think he installed all the smart strips and every night, you know, shutting everything off. And it's made a huge difference in their monthly bills. And one of the things we want to do is just continue that, get these energy clubs going in more schools. I mean, that's a big impact that one kid had on his house. Let's do more of that so his family can then spend their, use that money they're saving on something else. Um, this is one of our businesses we worked with. This is Ed Elder. He's in Rifle. And um, he's not a green hippie, as you can see. <laughs> he's not one that somebody could point at and say, oh, of course he would do upgrades. But of course he would. It makes sense. He's going to be saving 50% on his bills, um, on his electricity bills, which is going to be seven to $10,000 a year. And that's money that's directly back into his profits. Um, it's money he doesn't have to spend making, you know, on making that extra money. It's really helping his business. Um, we like to highlight our participants. We do lots of case studies in our ads. And then we also do these Energy Hero campaign ads for lots of our businesses, which is a really fun partnership. Because um, who doesn't want to pose like that? <laughs> and so we helped, um, you know, we help existing businesses. We've helped businesses who are upgrading their buildings, like Lori's here from the Carbondale Fo Food Co-op and they were expanding their space, and we used it as an opportunity to help them evaluate their cooling system and get a really, a much more efficient, much more effective cooling system in their building, helping them maximize some local rebates to help offset the cost, but overall, they're long, the, as long as they're gonna be in that building, their monthly energy bills are gonna be lower, which for a local food co-op that I shop at frequently, that's good for me, that's good for our community. Um, and we've done the same in Glenwood. We can help troubleshoot from the beginning so businesses can <coughs> start out operating uh, more, maximize their efficiency on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, so I wanted, because here, everybody's here talking about local vesting, my next couple slides are really talking about, okay, what can you do, what can we do as a community to continue this? And one of the things is our towns and utilities engaging in efficiency programs. It works. 
Most of our towns have economic development programs. Let's couple efficiency in with that economic development. Um, let's couple it with the downtown historic preservation. We had two businesses here in Glenwood that we worked with, and while they were doing efficiency upgrades, they also got the downtown historic grant for facade improvements, and we helped them replace windows, which windows aren't usually in a high item, high priority item, but if it's if they've got some money and they can improve their facade and we can help make sure that it's really energy efficient as well, then it's a win-win for everybody. Um, in addition, the towns and utilities can also invest in their own efficiency projects. Um, as Mike, in many of his presentations, points out, what we've learned is that every building is broken. And once we use the energy navigator to troubleshoot these public buildings, then we can all make them all more energy efficient. And then there's really good opportunities with renewable solar. This is Amelia Shelley with the library. This is a rooftop solar a system that they installed in the Rifle Library. Um, and they're making a big difference uh, on their utility bills and their long-term investment in solar. Um, if you're a business owner, if you're a homeowner, let's talk about some efficiency. I'm here, my cards are here, Mike's here. I mean, it starts, it starts with us and let's start saving some of your money on a monthly basis so you can put it into a local fund um, or your other investments. And these are two businesses that we worked with. I mean, businesses have huge opportunities, so um, we want to maximize those, and there's, there's lots of available skills in the Valley to help you maximize your efficiency. Um, another good investment these days is solar. There are some great rebates. And there's also opportunities for leasing a system on your roof or buying into a community solar system. Um, in the leasing opportunities, you start saving the next month after your system is installed. For purchasing a system, um, the numbers I had was, okay, um, what we were looking at is, I mean, paybacks after rebates can happen after eight to 10 years. So then the next 10 years or longer for the life of your system, you are just pocketing that money and there's your savings. Um, it could be a better return than certain bonds out there or your savings account at this point. I just wanted to touch on this, um, actually quickly threw in this slide during Amy's presentation because <laughs> this is definitely the group to think about some of these opportunities or the, the takeaways from this. Um, we do have a revolving loan program for businesses that we're about to launch. Uh, we also have a financing program for commercial businesses, and I think I saw Kent Wilson here from Alpine Bank, um, and that's currently the lender that we're working with. So businesses, if they don't have the, ca the um, cash flow to f for an efficiency project, we want to be able to develop some tools that they could finance that and make it worthwhile. Um, we're also looking into, and I want to talk to people who know more about this than I do, but let's do we could develop a local carbon offset fund. So if you take a plane trip somewhere and you want to offset your carbon, that money could go to local and then that could pay for grants or projects on local installs, local solar. Um, is there an opportunity for a local solar investment fund? That's my question to other experts in the room, but I think it could be a good one. Um, and this is gonna be a shameless plug for CLEAR as well. We're doing really great work in Garfield County and we want to do it elsewhere. Uh, like I said, Mike was in Summit County. We've been contacted by groups in Montana. And if another investment opportunity is to invest right in CLEAR and help us spread the word and get these projects. I mean, there are 3,000 counties in the country, and they could all benefit from these programs. Their public buildings could all benefit from the Energy Navigator. And so let's, let's go out and get those and see energy savings across the country um, and then and building all those local, local economies on that level. And I think my time is up, just in time. Um, a couple of questions for Erica yeah. while I change the PowerPoint. Yeah. So on the Energy Navigator, uh, is that just energynavigator.com or is it under clear? Where do I find that? It's garfieldenergynavigator.org. Okay. And we do have um, some materials in our brochure out in the hallway. Okay. So you can get my email and then that website. Right now, it's per building. Um, so when you click on it, um, which we would be happy, happy to fire it up over lunch if people wanted to come poke around. Um, so you click on the town of Carbondale, and then all of the buildings in Carbondale come up, and then you can click on the building you want to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else?
Thanks very much. We're doing rap rapid fire presentations. Erica is around during lunch, so if you want to catch her, if you think of some other questions. So we're going to switch right now to um, Doreen Harriet and Jill Zeman, who are going to talk about Garco Sewing Works. So forward, backward, and you got to hold this up a little bit. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, so glad we could come and talk about uh, our, our new little venture we have started. Garco Sewing Works was started by three of us. Beth Shaw, it couldn't be here. Um, unfortunately, she had to go to England. Um, so she just flew out last night. Uh, myself and Jill Zeman. The Garco Sewing Works project was started. Um, basically, the inception, the three of us got together. I, in my day job, work with um, Transamerica Financial Advisors, and I've had a lot of painful visits with clients through 2009 and 2010. People in um, construction, real estate, uh, you, you, they, they aren't making enough money, obviously, anymore. And so I had a lot of uh, situations where people were having to make very hard, painful decisions uh, because the income wasn't there anymore. They weren't able to save for retirement. And I approached uh, Jill, no, Beth, <laughs> about a year ago. It was in June of last year. I said, you know, we need another industry here. In my old life, 15 years ago, I came from downtown Los Angeles, or from the San Fernando Valley. I worked in downtown Los Angeles in the garment district for 15 years. Um, I was basically a fashion textile major in college. And uh, I, that was kind of my passion, but I had no idea. And as, and as I listened to uh, the speakers today, especially Joshua, when I, sorry, I'm not holding it close up. <laughs> when um, I worked in downtown Los Angeles, even though it was really gross compared to here, it was, um, everything was close by. I could literally, literally walk to any of the suppliers that I needed. Everything was in walking distance within a few blocks or so. So um, I really understand the, the principles now that they talk about. That's why those centers are, are in LA or New York. Anyway, so we started by getting together just on our own, volunteering. Once a week, we got together to mastermind about how we were going to start this process, um, identifying uh, local employees. Jill was, um, she's going to talk a bit about that, but that was, that's her forte as far as uh, supplying the workforce for us. Identifying, uh, researching potential products. We looked at a bunch of different things, and we were very lucky to um, come across, our, our big break was with CORE. Uh, they became our first customer. We saw an ad in the paper about the bag bands in Aspen and Carbondale and said, we need to talk to these people. They wanted to get these bag bands going through, but they didn't want to be purchasing bags from China to supplement what people are going to need. So we called them up and said, hey, we want to start a sewing factory. And bags are a perfect uh, first item for anybody to learn how to sew. So that was our, our big first break. And, and a lot of this wouldn't have happened without CORE. And um, so we had to get to the other, do a business plan, finding a suitable location. We wanted to be in Glenwood Springs, since all of us basically live and work in Glenwood Springs and close to CMC, because this, this entity is basically um, a collaboration between CMC and Garfield County. And um, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that we needed, like uh, floor level access, um, a place where trucks could pull into and drop off supplies and what have you. And uh, we um, went to different locations, and it, it's really kind of hard because basically we were looking to start a nonprofit, and um, we were looking for very cheap or free space, <laughs> which we found impossible to find in Glenwood. Uh, we also had to uh, do some researching with uh, funding and grants, which is Jill's, Jill's forte with her work with CMC. So that was, uh, luckily there's three of us that kind of had our expertise. Beth Shaw is in business development with CMC, so she has helped like companies like Fiberforge do the major expansion and movement that they've done. That they've done. Uh, Jill is um, not only funding, but also the personnel person because of the girls that we've had um, from her programs with CMC. And then, of course, I am the industry expert. <laughs> so um, we were able to formalize a business plan after all this planning. And um, 
funded. <laughs> it was like the perfect storm. Everything has really come together because we have a lot of people who um, are, are very interested in economic development, especially the Board of County Commissioners here in Garfield County. Um, are basically have been our heroes. They gave us a grant for equipment, 28,154. Uh, uh, most of that equipment, fortunately, I was really surprised to find out there is a company in Denver that is able to supply us with all these equipment, so that's semi-local, local, <laughs> compared to having to go to Los Angeles or back east where most of this equipment is. So we do have that luxury of um, the experts with the equipment and a bit of a garment industry in Denver too that has all the supplies that we basically needed. Um, when it came to the free building, we landed on the Henry Building and Rifle. Now, of course, all of us have to commute, but free is free. So <laughs> we were very lucky that um, that was available. That building has been vacant for years. It um, is right downtown Rifle, 3rd and East Avenue, so it's very close to you know, running out, getting something to eat, or going to the store, or whatever we might need. And um, the uh, county commissioners also gave us a grant for that building, so uh, that rent is paid for. They also went through a renovation on that building. It was formerly used for a um, social services, and there was a meeting room in the middle of the giant part of the building and they removed it and remodeled it for us so we didn't have to uh, pay for that. And um, just really, just short of one year of our first meetings of getting together, we had our grand opening in May of uh, last year. Um, I'm sorry, May of this year. And in June, we were able to get, um, thanks to Jill, a grant for $25,000 from the Colorado Women's Foundation. And we've also got a $2,000 grant from Rifle Community Fund. We're working on a business loan with Manaus Fund also. And this is, oh, this is a picture of the room that they uh, remodeled for us. Now it looks pretty. <laughs> it's really full now. This is, this is kind of nice to look at, the blank. Um, <clears throat> before all the machines were pulled in. So we had trainees, um, and another break we got with those was they came from uh, Jill Zeman's project, and I'm just gonna turn this over to Jill if you could talk about um, the girls in your project. temporary assistance for um, needy families and so part of that is um, the welfare to work requirements are that they have to put in so many hours of work experience and what I found over the last few years of working with these students getting them ready for college or ready for work is that the work experience job out there was not leading to jobs or training really they were walking dogs and working in thrift shops and things but um, so that's why when Doreen came to Beth, it was a perfect opportunity for some of these, um, mainly all women right now, mm -hmm. to really expand some skills and perhaps grow a new industry, so. <laughs> Thanks, that was quick. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we have trained a number and we're uh, a number of girls coming in and out. And of course it's not, every, it's not for everybody, um, but, uh, it, we, it, uh, we're very proud to have uh, some, some of the girls on payroll now. So, so we actually have four part-time people on payroll, which when the Board of County Commissioners passed this resolution, one of them mentioned something about if we can get one person off of state aid, this venture is paid for in the grants that they have given us. So um, we also are gonna be getting some, uh, we have two work-study students from CMC. <coughs> This is one of our girls, Jessica. Um, Jessica never touched a sewing machine before, not even a home sewing machine. And she is just taken to it like a fish on water. These are industrial machines that, even though I've sewn for over 35 years of my life, I'm kind of intimidated by these machines still. And she is one of the people we're paying, and she's also the type that um, is just catches on so quick. She has leadership abilities, and she is, being moved into a position of uh, uh, production supervisor on the floor. 
another one of our girls, Kayla, working on um, our big monster machine. This one's the, it's called a bar tack, and that's the thing that, that stitches the belt loops on your Levi's and your jeans. <laughs> and it's uh, our most expensive uh, machine, but uh, it's needed for those bags, <clears throat> to, for the straps. Um, so we have nine industrial machines, a uh, couple of pressing stations, cutting tables. We are set up to do pretty much vertical cutting and sewing. And um, I'm teaching some of the girls design and pattern making uh, <clears throat> skills as well. There is Beth Shaw down in the corner, since she can't be here, she's here with us in spirit, learning on the machines that were delivered. <clears throat> so our customers, of course, our first one was Core. Their initial order was 1,750 bags. They also sourced out the fabric for us, which was free. And uh, that was, that's another huge thing. We have had so many doma donations from people all throughout the valley of various things, whether it's grandma's old sewing supplies that nobody could throw away, or fabric, old um, uh, doodads, you name it. And so we've, most of it's been a lot of recycling. Core has also um, connected us with North Face, who, even though they didn't end up moving here, they're sending us sample yardage for free. And after working for 15 years in that industry, I know there's a lot of yardage that piles up that can be used for free. <clears throat> so uh, we have uh, a designer in Glenwood that, uh, where we've worked on her bags, number of designers from Carbondale that we're working on, and a lot of it's product development as well. That's something we're probably gonna be end up moving into, is helping some of these people with product development. We have, um, oh, there's the fabric that was sent to us for the core bags, our first shipment. <laughs> and it's, let me tell you from an industry, <laughs> It, it, dealing with these end pieces is, is labor intensive, so we're lucky we had some free labor. But we have customers calling us from all over the place. I'm start, we're starting production next week on somebody from uh, uh, Denver. She is doing some canvas bags that she's going to be selling at colleges that we're teaching the girls to do. We're working on a product with a couple from Denver who have a patent on a child restraining car system. And that's going to be a kind of a complicated one, too, but uh, it's exciting to be on. I've got us call, we've got calls as far away as Illinois and Alaska from people who basically are interested in working, um, getting their goods made in the USA. So that's another huge thing we have going towards us. We have an advisory board. Um, we'll be ha part of the rifle chamber pretty soon discussing a partnership with a nonprofit to provide our ongoing sales. We're going to be getting into selling our products ourselves, not just making products that other people sell. Valley View and Aspen Valley Hospitals have donated materials that make um, it's stuff that usually goes into a landfill that uh, we're able to make bags from, pretty much like the same bags from China, that same kind of polyurethane. <clears throat> Phase two is where we want to eventually start a for-profit factory. Right now, we're in the nonprofit stage, training facility, sort of a design business incubator. Um, it has a potential for 30 or more employees. The goal is to pay living wages that people, the people making the product can afford to buy the product. Um, profit sharing or employee-owned type of a business, unlike some of the ones I worked in, in the garment business in LA. And uh, on-site child care <clears throat> is also important because a lot of these operators are all moms. And Made in the USA has never been more important. It's never been more popular. And we are starting it here in Garfield, California. Gar Garfield, Colorado. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little... <laughs> slip back to the California days. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Doreen. Without Doreen, this project never would have gotten off the ground. Her expertise in manufacturing and garment industry has just been invaluable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious how you guys compare price-wise to China. Because I know prices are going You'll probably need this. Yeah. <coughs> well, the, did you turn it on? 
yeah, we'll never be making 85 cent bags that you can buy from China. Um, and that's gonna be a personal choice for people. There are some people still, you know, who, who need to buy the cheapest thing out there. Our bags, we're gonna be able to sell for the most part for $2. And that's gonna pay, that's calculated into pay the living wage for people. And mostly recycled products. Yeah, they paid a lot of money to ship the free fabric and stuff to us. So CORE has a lot invested, plus they paid us $2 a bag. But we can, as long as we're working with recycled goods or things that are donated, we can sell our bags for $2 retail from us, or direct from us, I should say. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Um, one, of the, one of the neat things about both the last two examples is uh, they're solving multiple problems. So it's not just a price point that you're, you know, there, there's clearly that decision making, but there's a job training aspect to this. There's a really neat uh, organization called the Manchester Bidwell Corporation in Pittsburgh, which takes arts and job training to, I mean, it's a much bigger organization, but the guy, Bill Strickland, got a MacArthur grant to do this. But you can just imagine taking some of the challenges we face and turn them into job training uh, and uh, money-saving opportunities. So a lot of this time, the money leaves our community, and these are opportunities to keep the money here, and it does multiple, multiple work. Um, our next speaker, Bill Stevenson, I'm very happy to have, he's traveling all over the place talking about this new program, and I'll let him talk about it, but um, what's, what's really neat about this is it's the whole notion of t a new twist on healthcare uh, and taking the cooperative model and applying it to health insurance. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Yeah, just quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Ford is there. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's great to be here. What an honor. We're delighted. Uh, we're in from Denver uh, to talk about a very, very exciting uh, new project uh, that we couldn't be more pleased uh, to be involved with at Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. But it's hard to, it's going to be hard to do any better than cargo sewing. So thank you uh, for that uh, presentation. That was absolutely terrific. Um, of course, I'm the last presenter before lunch, so I have a terrible, terrible problem in front of me to, to keep you interested for 20 minutes, but I think the subject, uh, the subject will, so let's give it a go. Um, we're here to talk about something that's really, really new, and we're here to also talk about how to make a big idea a reality, a really big idea a reality. Um, before I get into my, my text, I'd love to thank, again, Colin for the invitation. It's great to see uh, Randy Lowenthal back there. It's great to see you, Randy. Thank you so much. And I did want to welcome, uh, I brought uh, with me as, um, as a colleague, uh, Reverend Stephanie Price, who's a United Methodist minister in Denver, who's also one of our cooperative developers and is becoming more involved in the uh, health insurance co-op that I'm going to talk to you about now. Can you hear me OK? Everybody comfy in there? Back there? Good. OK, the Colorado Health Insurance Cooperative. What it takes, it takes, it, and it took a passion for, co for cooperatives, a real strong commitment to rural health care, uh, experience, deep, deep, meaningful experience in health insurance and health care, and incredibly strong connections built on lasting trust. And we'll get into the specifics of these very important values and characteristics as we go on. But in other words, all you have to do is just find some really smart, passionate folks who know everybody and are willing to work for free. It's easy. No problem. <laughs> all right, let's see how we did this. Well, let's do a little background first, if we could. Um, who we are, the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union Foundation. I am uh, the director of cooperative development for the foundation. I've been, so, been honored to be in that position for, um, 
for two years. Uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, as an organization, has advocated for family farmers and ranchers and rural communities in Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming since 1907. We have a century-long tradition as a developer of cooperatives in the rural Rocky Mountain region, and I was delighted to hear that word co-op used several times when uh, Stephanie and I arrived this morning uh, during that fine uh, urban uh, uh, development presentation that we heard. Okay, in this case, the RMFU Foundation is, is and was focused on one, rural health care needs, and two, how do we meet those needs using our very, very embraced, esteemed, loved cooperative business model? Uh, what's a cooperative business model? In summary, it's a grassroots, bottom-up organization. It's a member, user, driven, and governed organization. It has a very active board of directors. It has a staff philosophy of servant leadership. And the interests of others, in particular the customer members in a cooperative, they always come first. Okay, so the RMFU Foundation, we stepped up at once to sponsor a health insurance cooperative that would serve our rural communities. What enabled us to do that? Well, it's the Affordable Care Act that was uh, the pa uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act passed in 2010. You all remember the controversy surrounding that bill. Um, in that bill was, is a wonderful provision that provides for nonprofit, private, consumer-governed, consumer-operated and oriented plans, or co-ops. Isn't that clever? Consumer-operated and oriented plans. What, what a great acronym in this case. Um, what this program does is offer loans for new health insurance co-ops administered by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, it also, the act also created a health benefit exchange for individuals, families, and small groups uh, in each state. And you've heard, I know, about the health benefit exchange as it's developed in Colorado. It's really quite exciting. Um, Co-op policies, as Colin mentioned, will be uh, effective January 1, 2014. I wanna, I'm going to repeat that again. That's, that's just some really important information. Okay, let's get into some history and a bit of the chronology behind our co-op. Um, we began looking at this issue after we became familiar with the co-op part of the ACA. And we were wondering, as a farm-focused, farmer and rancher-focused organization, if a co-op, the, the capital, the capital co-op, could realistically focus only on rural health care needs. And we started out looking at both Colorado and Wyoming, two of the three states where Rocky Mountain Farmers Union does its work. Uh, we needed, we, right away we, need, we understood that we needed to find potential partners. We needed to find passionate people. There's that word that will keep uh, cropping up again in the context of our co-op. With rural health experience, health insurance, I'm sorry, with rural health experience, health insurance knowledge and experience, and ex expertise in forming and operating cooperatives. So we needed some real savvy in health care, some real savvy in health insurance, and some real savvy with respect to developing cooperatives. In the fall of 2011, we formed a working group. Uh, and that working group looked immediately at adding technical expertise and identifying what the next step would be if we were going to perhaps, just perhaps, apply for these loans from HHS. Uh, we decided that the, that next step involved a feasibility study with uh, the seeds in that study for a business plan if that feasibility study answered that all in quest, uh, important question with the word yes, we can go ahead and do this. Okay, what were the study requirements in this case? Health insurance, wow, health care. Lots of stuff going on. We needed an actuary. We needed statistical knowledge. We needed to understand the dynamics of provider networks. We needed, of course, to understand the, 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 the dynamics of claims payments, claims administration, also general insurance administration, and we needed some real legal savvy, using that word again. We certainly needed that as well. ACCA is a complicated statute. The co-op part of it, Section 1322, 
is a complicated part of that statute. Uh, we estimated the feasibility study to cost at uh, to cost about $100,000 plus. So wow, we had a big job ahead of us. Uh, we were extremely fortunate to have two partners who were so excited about this uh, idea step forward really almost immediately to see if we could get this going. One was the Colorado Health Foundation, and they committed $71,000 to the feasibility study. And the other was the USDA, US, uh, US uh, Department of Agriculture Rural Development Office, that committed $70,000 to RMFU as sponsor of the feasibility study. Okay, winter 2012, study completed. The study, the feasibility study reveals that while the rural focus, and that was so important to us, the rural focus is realistic. The co-op must seek members among urban dwellers to include enough policies, enough lives and in insurance lingo for the company to survive and thrive. And the study also at that time signaled, yes, we can go ahead with that understanding. It supported applying for the HHS loan for a statewide co-op, so no longer focused on rural Colorado alone, but a statewide Colorado co-op. We also determined as a result of that study that trying to do what we were doing in two different states with the regula regulatory environment in those states, et cetera, was just a little too challenging for us out of the blocks, so we decided to focus on Colorado only. Uh, we determined that 60% of the business of the new co-op would likely be sold through the new health benefits ex exchange, and that offers subsidies for lower income individuals. So we're certainly stepping into uh, the uninsured, the previously uninsured market that we've all heard so much about, and 40% through commercial agents and brokers. Okay, now to get formal and really get going, we had to uh, incorporate the co-op, and we did so as the Colorado Insurance Cooperative, Inc., it's a Colorado nonprofit cooperative. And if there are any Colorado cooperative experts in the audience, you will realize that that kind of, there's a little bit of a conflict there. Co-ops are generally for-profit uh, organizations, at least in Colorado. And to talk about a nonprofit uh, cooperative was a bit challenging, but nonetheless, we were able to do that through uh, some very clever drafting of our articles and bylaws, and of course, through the approval of the Colorado Secretary of State. We started with five directors and Rocky Mountain Farmers Union as the co-op's <laughs> sole member at this time. The members of the co-op ultimately will be all the policyholders of the co-op. Those will be the members of the co-op. The directors included a f include a former state rural health care expert, a woman named Lindy Wallace, a cooperative lawyer and developer, a wonderful guy named Chuck Holum, a former Colorado State Insurance Commissioner and State Auditor, Joanne Hill, a former health insurance company CEO, Barbara Brett, and a former rural health care administrator, and that's Mike Bloom. Okay, April 2012, we make our loan application for, wow, 69 million plus to, for startup and solvency loans. These are loans, not grants. Uh, to start our Colorado Health Insurance Cooperative. And while we get that, when we get that application in, and as we start to uh, wait for the process to, to unfold, we, we did go ahead and thanks again to the wonderful expertise we had free of charge from so many good, good people, we were able to begin some pretty heavy duty business planning. Um, we were delighted when we got notice in May of 2012 that the board was invited to Washington, D.C. on our own pennies to uh, interview with Deloitte. It was more than pennies, really, wasn't it? To interview with Deloitte, uh, which was counseling the Department of Health and Human Services on the selection process in D.C. So that was the, we knew that was the first hurdle. Got to get that interview with Deloitte. And we passed that hurdle. And off to D.C., our board went. Wow, in, needless to say, that interview went very, very well. Everybody came back from DC very pumped up, very optimistic that, that we may indeed be one of the, we're thinking three to five co-op applications out of Colorado that would be accepted. There were three to five groups trying to put together a co-op. Basically, uh, HHS is trying to establish a co-op in each, one co-op in each state. There can be two co-ops, two co 
But in Colorado's case, we were thinking that uh, given the relative size of our population, it, it's likely going to be just one. Um, well, in any event, in June, we hear that, that we have been accepted by HHS uh, for the uh, loan uh, program. And the, the negotiation of loan particulars began, which actually was quite a process. It was great to have so much expertise on our side as we, as we began doing that. Uh, also in June, as most of or all of you may remember, with all of the radio and TV and newspaper coverage, the US Supreme Court ruled the Affordable Care Act as constitutional. So that was sort of a nerve-wracking month for us. We were waiting to hear from HHS. And even after we heard from HHS that all was well, we were actually accepted. We knew that within a week or so, the Supreme Court would be making its decision. And everybody on McNeil Lair and every other show was, was guessing as to what that might be. So we were, yes, on the edge of our seats. Um, launch. The HHS loan documents in July 2012, they're signed. The transaction closes. And finally, it's been since June that we've known, but finally we were able to make the award public. OK, today we have two more board members a rural hospital administrator and the administrator of a rural federally qualified health, uh, health center. The first is uh, John Gardner, and the second is Jay Brook. And we, have a, and we have just hired, last week we hired our CEO after an extensive interview process that was amazing in the quality of folks that, that we got who really felt that this kind of new health insurance provider could make a huge, huge difference uh, in, uh, in the healthcare world. We have also engaged as consultants a human resources consultant, a project manager, legal counsel, a regulatory compliance specialist, an accounting firm, and a marketing PR firm. So we're getting out there at least into the consulting world, and I'll mention a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, but um, in, in kind of a big way. Today, uh, we, are high, we are in the process now, we have just closed the job postings for a chief financial officer, a regulatory compliance officer, and a director of consumer services. Now, that, those will be in the interview phase. I do want to sort of pitch one of those, um, well, all of those job applications, perhaps, who knows. But we did, have not found a chief financial officer candidate that completely uh, meets uh, the, the criteria that we're looking for. We, there, there were a number, all of them wonderful folks, but uh, we're still looking. We're going to be reopening the job posting for the chief financial officer. Um, soon to be posted will be a strategic project manager, a compliance specialist, IT, and executive assistant. And we at RMFU are going to be doing a lot of outreach, education, and community organizing with respect to this co-op. We see this very much as, as the members should, as our cooperative. And so we're extremely excited about doing that. So we'll be hiring too. What comes next? Co-op hires staff. We have to obtain, of course, an insurance license in Colorado. We uh, wait for the state to uh, actually create the exchange and let us know what the benefit plans and rating will look like. Uh, we will develop our benefit plans. We'll select a third-party administrator. Back to that consultant issue, we are farming out a lot of, we are outsourcing, I should say, a lot of the functions of this co-op. In many ways, it, it, it is an insurance company where we don't need to remake the wheel. There are consultants, there are companies out there that can provide this kind of work. Boy, that, if that's not a hint, I don't know what is. <laughs> the, uh, but I have like two more minutes and then I'll close. I'm sorry to keep you. I hear stomachs growling out there, so I will scoot here. Um, and that really is a hint. Um, <laughs> I will, no, no, Colin, please don't worry. No, no, I'll, I'll just close. I just have a few more. Okay. I, actually, Colin, no worries. So, so the last two slides. Um, and, oh, my goodness, there you are. You did it anyway. Thank you. Again, back to that notion that the first, we, we will not be marketing our policies until the fall of 2013. So we do have time, although it's very compressed. Um, and the first policies will be in effect 2014. What are our priorities? This is uniquely consumer-driven governed. This is a brand new type of insurance company. This is consumer, if you will, owned, and the consumers operate it, and that's what we're very excited about. That, we expect, will create a lot of member loyalty. That's what we hope for, and the four bullets after that sort of uh, follow up on that. 
We are looking at principles ahead of price. We will be price competitive. We have to be, but we will also always be doing the right thing. Extraordinary customer service. We are, looking, we are very proud to be community-based, and there will be an exceptional emphasis on wellness pre uh, prevention and personal responsibility. So in Reprise, what did it take to do this? Again, it took a passion for cooperatives. It took a commitment to rural health care. It took experience in health insurance and health care, the willingness of people to jump in. And it took strong connections built on lasting trust. To make it happen again, just find some really smart, passionate people who are willing to work for free. And you can do just about anything, can't you? <laughs> all right, that's all I've got. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Yes. The, no, no Colorado applicant received it. Uh, right now, there are 20, uh, 20 or so co-ops uh, throughout the country that have received loans from HHS, and they really are determined to see one co-op per state. So we'll see that process continue. Thank you for the question. Yes? Um, do you foresee this being more applicable to HR departments with lots of employees on benefits plans or for self-employed? Uh, self, at first, self-employed. We're focusing just on the individual and small group market. We do think there might be a niche for us in the large group market. But right now, uh, and I should have emphasized the brand new PowerPoint that I just put together. I'm sorry. I, I'll do better next time. But um, yes, w w w uh, individuals and small groups are our marketplace. No question. How many is small? How many is small? Certainly under 50. Um, and, uh, and, and we were expecting, really, with the, the wonderful actuary work that was done that was very highly statistical, we're guessing there's going to be a lot of business uh, with respect to uh, groups under 10. Yes? Do you remain a nonprofit, or is that just for during the census period? It will remain a nonprofit. All of the excess revenues generated, generated by the co-op go back into the co-op. Uh, in, the, in the form of lower or stable premiums, better services, better products. Uh, we're we're not, not to criticize the soul, but we're not in the business of paying million dollar salaries and having large, uh, tall glass buildings. That won't happen. <laughs> yes? Are there projections yet at how it will compete? Um, not. We, we're, again, working on that right now. I, I can tell you it will be competitive. We, we have to make it competitive or we won't make it. So uh, I promise you that. I'm a lawyer by training. We never guarantee anything, but I'm guaranteeing that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I have a question about um, one of your slides. Can you go into a little bit more about how the benefit packages will be created and who creates those? You bet. Uh, just very briefly, I know we're running into lunch. The, the Colorado Health Benefit Exchange will be doing a lot with respect to determining what benefits will look like. And they are presently working on that. We will need to follow the exchange's leads for, for, lead. For example, the exchange says, with respect to this particular type of plan, you have to have these 10 coverages. Well, we've got to have those 10 to be in the exchange. And we've got to be in the exchange to, to make our business plan work. So that will, be, go in, uh, that will enlarge, in a large way determine what we'll be doing as far as coverages. But, but we can get creative, too, when we intend to. Thank you, everybody. What an honor to be here. Thank you. Can you skip me some for lunch? So, so Bill will be here for lunch, which is coming up in a couple minutes. Um, so again, can't emphasize this enough. The world changed in 2008 dramatically. And uh, the rules have changed. And we have two examples of the rules changing, the Affordable Air, uh, Care Act and the Jobs Act have created opportunities for us to revisit pretty old ideas, co-ops have been around for a long time, and allows them to apply, are allowing us to apply them in much more creative ways than we ever have before. And it's a really a brave new world in terms of what we can make with these ideas. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty exciting time. Uh, there's lunch in the back. Feel free to go outside, get out of this hot room. Uh, we will reconvene here at 1 o'clock for our panel where we get into some more details about local vesting and how we can push this whole idea forward in the Roaring Fork Valley. And again, if you want to sign up for follow-up, 
on the uh, tables outside. Randy's collecting names. Uh, if you want us to contact you afterwards about local vesting group and going from there. So with that, please enjoy lunch, and we'll see you back here at 1 o'clock. Thanks, Jeff.